Douglas, Chapter 7. I lived in Master Hugh's family for about seven years. During this time, I succeeded in learning to read and write. To accomplish this, I had to use various tricks. I had no regular teacher. My mistress, who had kindly begun to instruct me, had, in obedience to her husband, not only stopped instructing me, but had set her face against my being instructed by anyone else. To be fair, she did not adopt this course of treatment immediately. She at first lacked the evil qualities necessary to shut me up in mental darkness. It was necessary for her to be taught to use irresponsible power before she was able to treat me as though I were an animal. My mistress was, as I have said, a kind and tender-hearted woman. In the basic goodness of her soul, she began, when I first went to live with her, to treat me as she believed one human being ought to treat another. As she began to exercise her duties as a slaveholder, she did not seem to understand that I was merely a piece of property. And she did not realize that to treat me as a human being was not only wrong, but dangerous. Slavery proved to be as harmful to her as it was to me. When I went there, she was a pious, warm woman. There was no sorrow or suffering for which she did not shed a tear. She had bread for the hungry, clothes for the naked, and comfort for every mourner that came within her reach. But slavery soon proved its ability to strip her of these heavenly qualities. Under its influence, the tender heart became stone, and the lamb-like personality gave way, gave way to one of tiger-like fierceness. The first step in her downward course was in her ceasing to instruct me. She then began to carry out her husband's beliefs, and she became even more convinced of those opinions than he himself. She was not satisfied with simply doing what he had commanded. She seemed anxious to do more. Nothing seemed to make her more angry than to see me with a newspaper. I have had her rush at me with a face full of fury and snatch the newspaper from me in a way that fully revealed her terror. She was a clever woman, and a little experience soon taught her the truth that education and slavery were incompatible with each other. From this time, I was most carefully watched. If I was in a separate room for any length of time, I was sure to be suspected of having a book, and was at once called to explain myself. All this, however, was too late. The first step had been taken. Mistress, in teaching me the alphabet, had given me the inch. No precaution could prevent me from taking the mile. The plan which I adopted was that of making friends with all the little white boys whom I met in the street. I convinced them. I convinced many of them to become my teachers. With their kindly aid, given at different times and in different places, I finally succeeded in learning to read. When I was sent on errands, I always took my book with me. By doing the errand quickly, I found time to get a lesson before my return. I used to carry bread with me, for I was better off in this regard than many of the poor white children in the neighborhood. This bread I used to give to the hungry little urchins, and in return, they would give me the more valuable bread of knowledge. I am strongly tempted to name two or three of those little boys as an expression of the gratitude and affection I feel for them, but good sense stops me. It is not that it would injure me, but it might embarrass them, for it is almost an unforgivable offense to teach slaves to read in this Christian country. It is enough to say that the dear little fellows lived on Philpot Street. I used to talk the matter of slavery over with them. I would sometimes say to them that I wished I could be as free as they would be when they got to be men. You will be free as soon as you are twenty-one, I would say, but I am a slave for life. Don't I have as much a right to be free as you? These words used to trouble them. They would express their lively sympathy and comfort me with the hope that something would happen and that I might someday be free. I was now about twelve years old, and the thought of being a slave for life began to weigh heavily on my heart. Just about that time, I got hold of a book called The Columbian Orator. Every opportunity I got, I used to read this book. Among many interesting stories, I found a dialogue between a master and his slave. The slave had run away from his master three times. The dialogue was supposed to be the conversation which took place between them when the slave was recaptured for the third time. In this dialogue, the master made all his arguments on behalf of slavery, and the slave pointed out the wrongness of each of those points. What the slave had to say was most intelligent and impressive, and it had such an effect that the master freed him on the spot. This was a marvelous document to me. The moral which I took from it was that truth had power even over the conscience of a slave owner. The more I read of this and other material, the more I grew to detest my enslavers.
I could see them as nothing but a band of successful robbers who had left their homes, gone to Africa, and stolen us from our homes in order to bring us to, the str to a strange land and reduce us to slavery. I hated them as the lowest and most wicked of men. As I read and thought, that dissatisfaction which Mr. Old had predicted came into being, tormenting and stinging my soul. As I suffered, I at times felt that learning to read had been a curse rather than a blessing. It had given me a view of my wretched condition, but no cure. It opened my eyes to the horrible pit, but gave me no ladder with which to get out. In moments of agony, I envied my fellow slaves for their ignorance. I often wished myself an animal. I preferred the life of a lowest reptile to my own. Anything, no matter what, to get rid of this thinking. It was this everlasting thinking about my condition that tormented me. But there was no getting rid of it. The silver trumpet of freedom had wakened my soul. Freedom now appeared and would never disappear again. It was heard in every sound and seen in everything. It was ever present, tormenting me with a sense of my miserable condition. It looked from every star. It smiled in every calm, breathed in every wind, and moved in every storm. I often found myself wishing myself dead. Except for the hope of being free, I no doubt would have killed myself or done something for which I would have been killed. While I was in this state of mind, I was eager to hear anyone speak about slavery. Every so often, I would hear something about the abolitionists. It was some time before I found out what that word meant. It was always used in a way that inter interested me. If a slave ran away and succeeded in escaping, or if a slave killed his master, set fire to a barn, or did anything very wrong in the mind of a slaveholder, it was blamed on abolition. Wanting to learn what this word meant, I went to the dictionary. It gave me a little help. I found out abolition meant the act of abolishing or getting rid of, but I did not know what was to be abolished. I was puzzled. I did not dare ask anyone about its meaning for I was sure that it was something my masters did not want me to know about. After a long wait, I got hold of a newspaper that contained a story about northern demands for the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia. From this, I began to understand what abolition and abolitionist meant. I always drew near when those words were spoken, expecting to hear something of importance to me and my fellow slaves. The light broke in upon me by degrees. One day, down by the wharf, I saw two Irishmen unloading stone. I went unasked and helped them. When we had finished, one of them asked if I were a slave. I told him I was. He asked, Are you a slave for life? I told him that I was. The good Irishman seemed deeply affected. He said to the other that it was a pity so fine a little fellow as myself should be a slave for life, and that it was a shame to hold me. They both advised me to run away to the north, that I should find friends there, and that I should be free. I pretended not to be interested, and acted as if I did not understand. I feared they might betray me. White men have been known to encourage slaves to escape, and then, to get the reward, catch them and return them to their masters. I was afraid that these seemingly good men might do that, but I still remembered their advice. I looked forward to a time when I would be safe, when it would be safe for me to escape. I was too young to think of doing so immediately. Besides, I wanted to learn how to write, so that I could some day forge my own freeman's papers. I comforted myself with the hope that I would one day find a good chance to go. Meanwhile, I would learn to write. The idea of how I might do that came to me as I watched the carpenters working in the shipyard. After cutting a piece of timber, they would write on it the part of the ship for which it was intended. A piece marked for the larboard side, for instance, was marked L. A piece for the starboard side was marked S. A piece for the larboard side forward was marked LF and so on. I began copying these letters, and within a short time could write them. After that, when I met a boy who I knew could write, I would tell him I could write as well as he. His next words would be, I don't believe you. Let me see you try. I would then make the letters and ask him to beat that. In this way, I got a good many lessons in writing, which I would never have gotten any other way. During this time, my copy book was the board fence, brick wall, and pavement. My pen and ink was a lump of chalk. With these, I learned the basics of writing. I then began copying words out of Webster's spelling book until I could write them all without looking at the book. By this time, my little Thomas Old had gone to school and learned to write. He had brought home his copy books, which had been shown to some of our neighbors, and then laid aside. 
My mistress used to go out every Monday afternoon and leave me to take care of the house. When I was left there, I used to spend the time writing in the spaces left in Thomas Old's copybook, copying what he had written. And so, after a long, tedious effort of many years, I learned to write.